The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to today's virtual tours webinar. And um, you know, we'll kind of just be standing by for the next five minutes until we get rolling. But if you have a chance, we ask that you do please click on that link in the chat. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about where you would love to do a um, you would like to take people as, as a field experience or as a potential virtual tour. Um, so just pick that spot on the map and um, it should show up. And, and if you have any questions that come up in the meantime or anything like that, um, you can feel free to just type into the question box and um, all the panelists and presenters that you see here will um, be able to see that. All right, so we'll be checking in in a couple minutes. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you can see a bunch of people are starting to arrive into the webinar and welcome. Uh, it's good to see you all in there. And, um, you know, just as a quick heads up, uh, we are using GoToWebinar here. And one of the one of the side effects to doing that is that there is actually no big wide open chat feature. There's only like question box. And we'll explain this a little bit more once we get started. But as a heads up, if you put something in the question box, it only comes to the panelists and presenters, the faces you see on the screen. Um, but we do have a, a chat that we are setting up um, in Padlet that we're going to be using, and we'll put the link to that in um, and send that around really soon as well. But in the meantime, um, you should see a link in your chat uh, to a map 
and that uh, another Padlet map. And if you don't mind, um, go ahead and click on that map and uh, select the spot that you think would be a, a fun place, good place, favorite place to um, bring people for a field experience or potentially a virtual field experience. Um, so with that, we're going to get started in kind of just one minute. Um, yeah, so before we get started, if you're having trouble navigating multiple windows, um, you can also take a picture of the QR code with your phone, which I'm currently doing, and I'm monitoring the maps. So it's fun to see people marking places. Um, what do I see? South Africa and Brazil, across the United States, which is fun. Um, and somewhere in the Pacific. I don't know if I can zoom down enough to figure out where that is. Fiji. All right, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Well, um, given the time, I think we can get started. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to uh, our first MIWI Practitioners webinar. Um, and for those of you just coming in, what we've been asking is people to visit the Padlet that's currently on the screen. So again, you can use your phone to take a picture of the QR code and it'll come up on your, your phone, or you can type, um, type the link that we currently have into the chat to visit it. And we're just asking you to, no restrictions, think about anywhere in the world, where would you like to give a field experience? And so it's kind of fun now looking at it and seeing those pins populate. Um, but they'll be bringing it up later in their talk, um, so don't worry. Uh, it is just for fun, but they'll also be referencing back to it too. Um, so if you want to click to the next slide. So I, um, I work at the NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office, the Environmental Science Training Center. And we're the ones that host these MIWI practitioner webinars. So I'm Krista Hogan. With me, I have my colleague Bart Merrick and also Elise Trelligan. So we'll be on the webinar throughout the uh, afternoon. So if you have any questions about NOAA, ESTC, and about this series, feel free to drop them into that question box and we'll make sure to answer them. So as I said, this is the first of the series and we're excited to have um, Ed and his team. They'll be talking about using a virtual tour tool to create field experiences. So we'll be digging into that. But looking ahead, we do have three more that are scheduled and they're all uh, visible now on that slide. And know that at any time you can go to um, the Environmental Science Training Center's website. Um, so if Bart, you wanna throw that into the link and you can register for these webinars or at least mark them on your calendar if we don't have the registration link up quite yet. Um, but we're excited to have a bunch of our colleagues come on. We'll have science topics and also of course teaching topics. Um, so if you want to click to the next slide. So we are using a GoToWebinar. Um, we know there's all these different platforms out there, so we want to make sure that everyone just knows what they're doing. Um, as an audience member, we have you muted and we have your videos off. Um, so the best way to communicate with us is actually to throw a question into that question box, which is the side panel there. Um, it's highlighted in that red box. And then just if you wanna look up at the top real quick, the side panel or the side, I guess it's not on the side, the navigation panel on the top, um, that's how you can control your view. So if you want, you can turn our webcams on and off. Um, you can make the slide bigger. You can even take a screenshot of the slide or zoom in or out if you wanna see something better. Um, so if you wanna to click to the next slide, the next slide actually just focuses in on that question box. So with this question box, um, all of your questions will go to us, uh, the panelists. So no one else will see them, but throw them in that box. If it's timely, we'll try to kindly interrupt them and ask those questions, but we also might just wait to the very end. But know that they're not just going into a black hole, we're watching that box. We'll make sure to address them if we can. Um, so if you wanna to click to the next slide. So uh, the, the bummer, the slight bummer with GoToWebinar is there isn't a chat box that a lot of us are familiar with if you're using some of the other platforms that everyone can add to and everyone can see at once. Um, so instead, what they're gonna be using is another Padlet. And this is gonna be in a stream format. So throughout the webinar, they're gonna be asking questions, having prompts, and they're gonna ask you to go into this Padlet where you can type your responses. And we'll have someone in there always looking at it as well. And again, you know, addressing any questions that might come up. So before we get started, if you just wanna take this moment now, 
Um, if someone could throw that link into the chat, you could either click that link, bring it up into um, a second window and just kind of have it minimized and on the side. Or again, if you're comfortable, you could take your phone out and you could take a picture of that QR code and then it should pop up um, in whatever internet browser you have on your phone and you could have it on the side too. Um, so just have that going and they'll tell you when they want you to bring up that Padlet and interact with it. Um, but otherwise, I think that's about it for now. So I think I'll pass it off to Ed. Hello all, and thanks so much for being here. I'm really pleased to be here with this team, not only the presentation team, but the broader team from DNR and NOAA and the, the folks that are, have just been doing the introductions. Uh, we are gonna be talking about virtual tours supporting real world environmental field experiences. And we really want to emphasize a couple of things about this title as we get started, and that we are working in this area to support the real world environmental experiences, not replace them. Uh, we recognize that the value of field experiences is very high and really are irreplaceable. But in these days that we're all in with the pandemic, we have been developing some ideas about how to use virtual contexts to support those environmental explorations at the actual sites. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today is that interaction between those things. I'm here with a team that has been doing some of this work already uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so we will be sharing our ideas about this with you. Um, I am Ed Robeck. I am Director of Education and Outreach at the American Geosciences Institute. My background is in science education, both formal and informal and also in teacher education at Salisbury University here on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Carpenter. Um, greetings this evening from the Netherlands. Um, though I am a long-standing DC resident, I've only been here for a year. Uh, I've been working in um, science education, geoscience education for 15 years um, in curriculum design and teacher professional development. Um, a couple of my recent interests have been the design of computer generated imagery uh, to show landscapes and environments that are difficult to see or buried in the geologic past and kind of combined with experiences in working with data um, for undergraduate lab manuals. Uh, it sort of led me to a, a natural conclusion and that is how to combine the virtual world with data through uh, the development of virtual field trips. So I'm glad to be with you this evening. Good evening, I'm Hema Baskaran. I'm a high school science teacher uh, on a mission to provide meaningful educational experiences, uh, especially now in the virtual environment. And I'm excited to be a part of this team sharing all the information with all of you. Hello everybody, I'm Aida Awad. I'm a senior educational consultant with AGI. I'm an adjunct instructor teaching environmental science at AIU currently. I spent um, 30-ish years in K-12 education, about, <clears throat> excuse me, split about half between the classroom and administration. I was lucky enough to be an Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow at the Department of Energy in 2016-2017, and I'm past president of NAGT. I'm also a Google Certified Trainer. I'm keenly interested in the integration of technology and teaching across the board, but primarily in the geosciences. Happy to be with you. Nice to meet you all. Sequoia. Thanks, Aida. My name is Sequoia McGee. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Education and Outreach Department at AGI. I'm currently located in the DC area, Arlington specifically. Um, I am going to be doing a lot of the behind the scenes, uh, so logistics and coordination for the upcoming virtual tours and place-based learning workshops. Thanks everyone for those introductions. And we'll get on with the webinar now. You can see the webinar agenda. Uh, we'll be going to be talking a lot about something that we're going to be calling virtual context for environmental exploration or just VCs. So when you hear that term, that's really what we're talking about. And we'll make a distinction between those and some other things that you might have heard of before as we go forward. Um, you can see that we have a lot to cover today. Uh, we're gonna to be focusing a lot on place-based education as a framework for all of this work. We'll also be mentioning MIWIs and other curriculum connections a lot of the stakeholders that we're working with and that perhaps you're working with are educators that rely on those and also talking about the the process for designing and creating the virtual context or the vcs 
using Google Tour Creator, although other uh, platforms are also possible to use for this, the products are somewhat different. Today, we'll be focusing on, on Google Tour Creator. We did want to mention quickly that there are some upcoming workshops that go into further detail and uh, support participants even more with the creation and the process of creating the virtual contexts. Uh, one of those is being hosted by Shore Rivers. We, we learned uh, this week that that one is full, and so the registration for that is closed. But at the end of the presentation, uh, uh, Britt will be talking about some of the, the um, an upcoming opportunity that in some of the steps that are being taken to organize another workshop. And with that, Aida. Okay, um, I'd love to get you started with this. And, and to do that, I'm gonna ask you to just take about 10 or 15 seconds and close your eyes, really close your eyes. And um, as you do that, think about a place that has a deep meaning for you. And then what about that place makes it particularly meaningful to you? And we would love to ask you here at this point to go to the chat, to the Padlet at bit.ly forward slash vtourchat. Many of you have that open already. And type into the Padlet, what's the place and a couple of attributes, a couple of reasons that it has so much meaning for you. Let me give you a second to do that. Don't forget to add some of the reasons that it has meaning for you. So I'm seeing lots of places. I'm seeing Cape Cod, Provincetown, Massachusetts. It has everything you love, great. <laughs> Cape Cod because of the beautiful landscapes. So beautiful landscapes, we're thinking about natural attributes there. Provincetown, Massachusetts, um, ocean, dunes, and your family. Cape Cod also because you loved it when you worked there. Family vacations in Muir Woods out just north of San Francisco. Uh, a backyard, the natural light and native plants and family. Beautiful, thank you. Grimley Island, Iceland, it was my honeymoon and the puffins were zooming all around me. <laughs> it sounds fun. And we have someone who's posting a picture of a favorite pet, the alligator from southern or southeastern Louisiana. I don't think it's a pet. Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries because of all the critters. Great. Thank you for sharing those ideas. Um, just as a, as a quick note, we do this same activity with students and with uh, teachers in our longer workshops. And when we do this activity, we actually ask them to draw a representation of the place and then try to draw in what makes it meaningful to them. So keep that place in mind as we go through the next several slides. We're gonna ask you to come back to that place and to the place that you posted on the map earlier. Turn it back over here to myself, I think. <laughs> so um, as you're thinking about that place, can you go there and what if you couldn't go there? What if you wanted to take people there, perhaps visitors to your center, and you couldn't do that? What would the challenges be? I'm going to turn it over to Hema. So perhaps, perhaps Sam is having some trouble getting the audio up. I'll go ahead and do, speak to this. Um, what we really want to focus on here is the idea that um, to keep people engaged with environmental exploration and education while there is a pandemic, it presents us as informal educators with a number of challenges. And that challenge was presented to me by one of the science supervisors that I work with in a local school system. And we worked out this idea of doing these virtual contexts where students could work to explore the sites virtually as part of their preparation for going to them. 
So this is really the set of questions that we're working to address. And I'm going to now take you on a couple of tours uh, so you can see what we're talking about when we're talking about, um, about these virtual contexts. And um, I'm going to take over the sharing of my screen so that I can do this. There you go ahead. And just to add, I think you might have hit your mute button. I can't quite hear you right now. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay. Um, okay, so now I'm sharing my screen. I think you can see the slides um, <clears throat> that I'm going to be looking at. We are um, okay. So the problem during uh, COVID-19 is that students are not able to engage in these scheduled experiences. So to keep them engaged with the environmental sites, we wanted to provide these opportunities. And even though we, um, we recognize that uh, the students are uh, in school and we're trying to do a lot of different things with them, we wanted to prepare them for their, their field experiences. So um, let me switch screens here again. Okay. And I'm going to show you a couple of these tours. So this is a tour that I created near my home. Um, and what you're looking at here is just a set of trees, but you're able to pan around during the tour. And this tour that I created is a demonstration of one that would be focused on the theme of biospheres. So my first scene is on, uh, excuse me, it's on Earth systems. And the first scene is on biospheres. So um, I'm looking at this and one of the things that you notice here is that I can pan around freely and with that, I can open these spots that are highlighted as points of interest. This one is a deer that uh, was seen here and photographed in this location. And then for the point of interest, I'm able to type in or see some information about that point of interest. And then here's another animal that was spotted in this area. This is a great horned owl. And again, some information about this. And then to expand the possibilities, you can use various kinds of media. It doesn't always have to be photographed. So here is an artistic representation of some of the elements in this area and how they might can, these can be used to talk about how these might connect to each other, uh, the elements from the scene. And in this case as well, uh, this is second growth forest. So one of the things that we think about here is the history of the location and the fact that there was a lot of logging done on the Eastern shore. And so we can get into the history of that as well and the impact that that has had on the, um, on the, uh, the ecosystems and the earth systems. So that's one scene. I'm gonna to go to a second scene. So this puts us in a different setting notice here that this one doesn't have a top or a bottom this is done as a panorama um, but here we're looking at the hydrosphere and we can notice that there is a, a small creek that runs in this area and we can look at how that affects the ecosystem we can then start to think about where the water from the creek comes from when it rains the fact that it gets the leaves wet and drops on the leaves and then collects in the stream and we can start to look at the hydrosphere as a place where we can start to think about um, the data that we can collect, the rainfall data, for example, that we can collect and how we can start to actually measure some of the things in this setting and using that, this setting as a place to contextualize those data. 
And also we can include maps to see how the different parts of the location relate to each other in a geographic sense. So this is just a very quick um, tour of this site. And you can see that a lot of thought goes into creating it. We'll talk some more about that thought in just a bit. In one of the workshops we did, we have, um, we had teachers create site, these sites. And this is one at a place called Hunts Hill, uh, where they create a virtual context, in many cases using their own photos uh, as well. So being able to include information um, about different uh, places, about things that they have experienced, but relating it all to, again, the Earth systems as part of their curriculum and what they were doing. Now, the idea is, again, that this is something that the students, the learners themselves will create. We'll get to that part in a bit. In fact, um, this is one, I'm just gonna show this tour very quickly, <clears throat> where, there we are. Uh, this is one of Hema's students. She gave this assignment in her ongoing environmental science class. And this is one of the tours that one of her students created about a favorite place in Salisbury, Maryland. And some of the, his, the personal history that the student has shows up um, in this, some of their memories of the different parts of the park that they've used and, on, and the, some of their favorite locations. So this is how these look. This is how they're uh, uh, put together. A very quick demonstration of how that's done. If you go, go, go to Google Tour Creator, um, you can do this very quickly. Uh, you have uh, the opportunity to start a new tour. And then you just select an image to do this. And this becomes pretty intuitive pretty quickly. I have an image that I want. I'm going to sort of recreate the one that you've already seen. So this is the opening uh, scene uh, for the cover photo. This is, I'm going to call this a demonstration and I can describe it here. And then I can put it in a category, which just helps people to find it um, when they're searching. And I create the tour. And then I want to do my first scene. This says add scene. So I'm going to upload, in this case, a 360 image. This is a spherical image that was captured by, on a 360 camera. And you can see that when you add it initially, it looks a little wonky. It does not look the way we would expect it to. But then when we actually add it to the scene, because it's a spherical image, now you can see that it looks like it should, we can pan around. And then to add the points of interest, I just first need to move this menu. <laughs> so, I add a point of interest. I can say this is a deer. And then I can go and I can get the photo from my folder on my computer. And there it is. And then I can add it. And then when I click on that, the image will open. It'll take a moment to upload, but the image will open. It's maybe too large or not exactly in the right place, so I can move it around. I can resize it um, and make it more to my liking. And I can do that with each of the pieces of media that I do, and then I can add another scene. Uh, in this case, I'm going to add the second scene that was in that tour. This one, as I pointed out, was a pan. Uh, panoramic photo that was just taken with my iPhone camera and there I am and then I can also when this uploads I can add it to the tour and I'm doing this very quickly and we do recommend that people start with an exploratory phase where they just play around and build things and then we'll talk in a moment about what some of the planning is that goes into these so again, Ed, this is, yes? Someone asked, is this doable without a 360 camera? Can you address that? Oh yes, very good, thank you. 
uh, yes, this image, for example, is done with a panoramic image from my iPhone. Notice there's no um, uh, what's called Nader, <laughs> and there's also no Zenith, uh, where on the other image that I had, um, there that was done with a 360 camera. So that one you can see all around. Um, you can see up and down as well. And in fact, you can see the person taking the photo at the Nader, what's referred to as the Nader. So yes, you can. Hey, Ed, um, I've had a few questions come to the question box of people just having trouble watching the Google tour live. Um, I don't know if it's like a, a bandwidth issue, but someone has been asking, you know, do you think it's like a difference between PC and Mac or do you need Google Earth downloaded? Um, you actually, after you're done, the last step to creating these is to then go up here and publish them. And they are published to us another site called Poly. And Poly is not something that you have to have any resident application on. So, it, and we haven't had trouble with anybody with a particular computer having issues with that. Sometimes we do have browser interference. Um, they work better on Chrome than in my case, for example, I have trouble opening them on Explorer sometimes. So that might be the thing that they're running into with that. And I was going to, with that, if there are no other questions, um, I was going to try and turn it back over to Aida to share slides. Just and a second, we have a couple other questions. Um, sure. There was a question about whether you could embed narration. Uh, so in Google Tour Creator, there is the ability to pull in a narration file. You can't record the narration in Google Tour Creator. You need to use a separate um, application to do that. There are many free browser-based applications where you can record that sound and then embed it into the Google Tour Creator Tour so that when you view the tour, the narration will play. Um, and then there was another question about whether you could insert video or just pictures. You can also uh, insert YouTube links, and that's true for um, Google Earth Projects as well as Google Tour Creator. So. Yes, you can do that. Um, let's see if there were. So I had a one note about that, however. So here's the link, for example, um, on one of the, um, the this on this teacher made tour. And she does include um, a couple of links to videos, but those videos do not play within the same window. So you need to go to this link. The link is here. And then if I just highlight the link and I right click on it, then it will go to that and that video will play. Right. I think that does it for the questions. Thanks for okay. asking those. If there are others, please put them in again. I must have missed them as I was scrolling through. So, all right. Ed, all right. did you want to continue to share slides or did you want me to share them? Um, why don't you pick up, please? Okay, Bart, can you set me up to grab the slides again, please? You should be good now, I don't think so. Yes, clicked on show my screen. Thank you for everybody's patience. This is um, kind of a new application for us, and so we're we're getting used to it. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep, we see your screen and- uh, Perfect. In slide mode. Here we go. All right, I'm gonna turn this slide over to Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, we've, thank you, Ed, for showing us um, through, you know, what you're describing uh, as a virtual context. And, um, you know, we've, there are many different sort of design elements and different ways to develop a virtual context. But um, just to sort of put everyone on the same page, you know, um, what we're calling um, a virtual context is um, a designed virtual space um, where students basically are engaged uh, in the construction of the virtual material uh, and as part of that uh, are actively engaged in the planning of the media, uh, the planning of the content and the data. And then um, there's really two major parts to this process and the outcome uh, is really the tip of the pyramid um, below which uh, a large amount of planning and decision making takes place. 
uh, and uh, through that decision making um, by, lo by looking at data uh, and by considering various uh, illustrations of, the, of the, 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 the natural or cultural environment, this, the students start to develop a, a sort of stronger and a, a sense of place. Uh, and all of this is really reflected in their final piece of work. But during the assimilation phase, um, the students actually develop a large amount of, of, of working knowledge. Um, these, products, uh, these projects are also um, multidimensional uh, in several ways. Um, they encourage uh, moving uh, across spatial dimensions from one site to another and allow opportunities uh, to work at very small scales of resolution. Uh, and much larger ones, uh, and that's very aligned to the cross-cutting concepts in the next, genera next generation science standards. Um, they also allow the integration of multiple content areas, um, which means they're sort of suitable for uh, applications to um, various sciences and uh, various science subjects and non-science subjects, again, um, because they're sort of student-driven, uh, those decisions are, are tend to be made by the student, but of course they will be sort of aligned to the question directions from the education resource centers that you're working in. Uh, they also allow the use of sort of multiple data sets as, as well um, to illustrate uh, the behavior of some of the attributes which they're going to include or choose to include within their, um, within their VCs. Um, they're gonna, students are gonna work with a variety of different media types, which is very interesting because they will uh, develop uh, broader communication skills by working with text mathematizing uh, and also working with video and audio media um, and also within this as well they'll start to develop a, an appreciation uh, of a sense of place and that's going to lead to the development of uh, value frameworks as well um, so the at the heart of this approach uh, is the notion uh, of place-based education uh, and that really extends beyond the realm solely of geoscience and sort of create, creates a connection between sort of the earth sciences or geoscience uh, and geography and a range of other subjects as well. And I will pass you over on the next slide to Aida to talk a little bit more about place-based education. Thanks, Mark. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to start to build an understanding of how the tenets of place-based education can support the development of virtual contexts and field experiences. And these next couple of slides come from the work of Dr. Steve Semkin. And Steve's a professor of geology and education um, at Arizona State University. So we thank Steve for sharing these slides with us for this webinar. So as we start to think more deeply about place-based education, I'd like you to think back to the place that you'd like to take people on a field experience. Maybe it's the place that you pinned on the map. Maybe it's the place that you thought of as your meaningful place. Maybe it's a place that came up as Ed was going through his demonstration. Place-based education is teaching and learning that is situated in place. It's through the natural and the cultural attributes of the place that meaning and relevance are developed for those engaging in the experience. And in a minute, we're going to look more closely at what we mean by natural and cultural attributes. But before we do, I'd like us to consider these two quotes. Um, Dr. Dr. Semkin uses these quotes kind of to ground the importance of place-based education. And the first quote comes from Greg Smith. Um, and Greg Smith say, says that place-based education is what happened before schools were created. And he also says that place-based education is the new old way of teaching. And then the quote from Dudley Patterson, who is an Apache elder, who said, wisdom sits in places. And I've heard uh, Dr. Semkin follow up that quote with another one saying, you have to know places intimately to drink of their wisdom. I really like that one. So on this slide, we can see our connection to places and how it influences how we teach and learn about them. In fact, the knowledge that we gain about places becomes part of the meaningfulness we attribute to those places and contributes to the place making and a sense of place. In other words, we learn from and feel for the places that have meaning for us. And I think that these five design elements shown on this slide really describe how. 
Uh, first on the bottom left here, we're going to kind of go around in a, in a clockwise way. We focus on content and it's the natural attribute of that place. Think for a minute about the natural attribute of the place that you would take people. What content does that bring to mind? Next, the cultural attributes of the place, they add context and relevance for us. And then third up at the top, we can teach in the place or in ways that suggest the place. And these might be through some things like a virtual context where we can include maps and data and artifacts and even color schemes that help us to evoke that sense of place. The fourth design element is that we teach ideas that promote thinking and actions that encourage sustainability and resilience for that place. And then finally, we can encourage and guide people to form their own intellectual and emotional connections to the place. So that's a lot. <laughs> I want to just pause here for a minute, ask you to type into the Padlet once again. So this time, Think about which of the five design elements can be featured in a meaningful place where you might actually build a virtual context. And you can see those design elements here. Let's go ahead and type into the Padlet. The link is up in the top. If you've uh, lost that one, jump back in there. And let's share some ideas about the design elements that might be featured in an actual VC that you might, or virtual context that you might create. So maybe in this case, it's a good idea to list the place again and then add in the element, design element. Okay, so someone is talking about an authentic experience being bird banding. Okay, great. Um, which location is that? Seeing other people typing in, We've got some places here waiting for their their design elements to be added. Give it a minute. Uh, somebody wanted to bring us to Paris for the cultural attributes. Thank you. We'll all come along. <laughs> Fish in the 18 Mile Creek. Um, oh, here's a really interesting one. Belle Isle, a historic site particularly Civil War, and then also the river features. So we have cultural features and we have the natural attributes as well. Very interesting. Lake District hike, which would include uh, geology, water flowing, mountains, lakes. So all of those natural attributes, sure. Let's give it a couple seconds and take a couple more. Um, sand dunes. So wind, saltation, and deposition, watersheds, macroinvertebrates, biotic index, and biological assessment, right? Uh, the US Virgin Islands, snorkeling, scuba, and an underwater trail. Here we have one that talks about emotional connections, personal connections reminds me of things. Thanks, and you can continue to type into that. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to turn this back over to Mark. Take it away, Mark. Thanks very much, Aida. Um, so um, what I want to talk about a little bit is um, some of Steve's ideas um, about um, a sense of place. So um, with the students that we're working with, um, what we're really trying to do is, is develop um, a stronger meaning to a particular location. So, um, you know, and it's important, I think, to have a fairly broad content, a broad understanding of um, what a place really is. And in, in place-based education, um, any location, uh, real, virtual, or imaginary, that we give meaning to um, by means of an experience um, constitutes a place. So that means that um, an estuary in Chesapeake Bay is a place, uh, a quarry in the bay is a place, the model of an exoplanet is a place, uh, and even Hogwarts is a place if it has meaning to um, meaning to the person who's experienced it. The key factor here is that um, we can have places have meanings for us for a great variety of different reasons. They can be aesthetic reasons related to beauty, 
and that can quite often be the hook uh, that even draws a, sign, a professional scientist to a, a place during one of their junior studies. Uh, it can be a cultural meaning, a historical meaning, scientific meaning, um, and really any, any meaning at all, uh, economic, religious, um, uh, and, and so on. For places, uh, we attach uh, sentiments to them or feelings or, or, or strengths of emotion. Uh, and the place attachments can really vary from very strong positive attachments. Uh, and again, those could be related to areas of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, we can have neutral attachments or we can have uh, even negative attachments. And perhaps an example of a negative attachment is an environment that we think is changing uh, faster than it other, that otherwise naturally would or an environment which has perhaps um, changed significantly due to say resource depletion. But these, these two things together uh, that provide uh, a sense of place. So all pla a, a sense of place is largely derived from those two things. It's the place meanings and it's the place attachments. And that sense of place can be an individual thing or it can be uh, something which is derived by groups. It's very interesting. Um, a sense of place is absolutely you know, relevant to science teaching because um, the more connected we are to scientific knowledge, then the, the greater we understand a particular place. And with that, it has greater meaning, intellectual meaning. Uh, and from that intellectual meaning, we tend to have a stronger attachment. So we hypothesize or, or really contend here that um, field experiences in the natural environment um, and field experiences in virtual contexts will support the development of a stronger and potentially positive sense of place. And that positive sense of place uh, is well documented to relate to um, pro positive pro-environmental attitudes and behaviors. The more we understand about a place, uh, the greater we can assess its significance and also uh, any we can relate to or, or, or start to understand deviations or changes in the behavioral nature of that place. And on to the next slide. So I want to kind of draw back uh, to back towards the the relationship between virtual context and uh, virtual context and, and virtual field trips. Uh, they both have um, several commonalities and they have some significant differences as as well. Um, we can see that both are um, visually rich. Uh, they allow unstructured movement. Uh, they provide an engaging exposure to a site. Uh, they encourage questioning. Um, and they can include various forms of media, uh, possibly viewable in two dimensions or three dimensions, depending on the, the data capture. Uh, and they can be the basis for a range of learning tasks. And both media uh, evoke a sense of place. Virtual field trips are, are diverse in their nature, but many of them, uh, the large majority of them that students use are pre-made um, by others and are visually engaging um, and focus in, uh, in a variety of environments from inaccessible locations to uh, to accessible locations. And they typically reinforce content through, through visual environments. Virtual context, which we're talking about here with place-based education, of which virtual field trips are a part, are really emphasizing this, the element of student co-creation. Uh, and, and with that student co-creation, um, we are trying to uh, really um, encourage the uh, interdisciplinary uh, application of knowledge by students and also to promote multiple cultural perspectives um, within the work that they're doing. As, as, Ed, as Ed mentioned, excuse me, at the very beginning, um, the virtual contexts um, are not a replacement for, for field experiences and they're really an augmentation for virtual field trips. Um, but one thing they do enable um, using the, the Google Tour Creator, as Ed was showing, um, was an opportunity to encourage planning for actual field experiences. And it, effectively, that is to um, enable students to work on a pre-field trip before an actual field experience. And with that, the next slide, please. So um, as stated, virtual VCs are really not replacements for, 
being in the field, but um, due to present conditions, the field is a little bit less accessible than we would otherwise hope for. Um, so for now, they give us an opportunity su to support time in the field. And sometimes um, during field experiences, um, there is a very uh, a vertical learning curve at the beginning where students are trying to get used to the environment they're in, uh, a novel environment. And the VCs can provide uh, a way of structuring or familiarizing students with the field experience, the actual field experience to come. So what I'd like you to do now is to return to the Padlet and think about for the environment that you're working in, how you might use uh, a VC to be designed as a pre-trip experience. And we'll take a, a short while to do that and then we'll read out some of the descriptions. Aida, can you see the Padlet? I can, Mark, and I'm just taking a look here as people are starting to type in here. Um, so a couple of ideas, have students plan where they would explore and study. Um, it could be used to give an overview of the place and having students create I statements. I think I notice, especially things like I wonder, that's a nice one, thank you for sharing that. I would like to show students and participants what the area looks like and just see what questions and concerns they might have as they're familiarizing themselves with the, the lay of the land for an upcoming field trip or research. And maybe one more here. Um, have students see the place and identify an issue that they would like to study further. So that's a, a good wrap up. Go ahead and continue to type into the Padlet. You will have access to the Padlet after the webinar, so you can come back and read some more of the comments there. Back to you, Mark. Excellent. Um, I, I am going to hand you over actually now to, uh, to Ed. Hi, Al. So Mark talked about the various perspectives that can be used for developing this within a place-based concept and or construct. And the idea here in, on this slide is that these virtual contexts really allow for transformations of ideas between a variety of different media. And that's important in a number of ways. So the images can be related to maps, the maps can be related to artwork, historical archival material, as you can see, data and student writing, all of these things are blended together in the virtual contexts. And on the next slide, I actually put uh, in here the my uh, notes as I that I was using as I made my virtual context that I developed that I showed you first. Um, these notes are very rough. They, I scratch things out. And, and we look at things, but we're looking at what media we use, what notes, what are the points of interest, what are we trying to do with these. So after you explore with Google Tour Creator some, you can then follow up with some organized planning, and it's that organized planning that starts to really help to solidify the learning. And there is a learning theory behind this, which is shown on the next slide, that we're not going to be able to go into in great detail in this case, but the idea here, stated very briefly, is that Within uh, the idea of how people learn, this is referred to as information processing theory, but it's specifically with media, that the media provide inputs, which then go through sensory memory and working memory and into long-term memory. And the short version of this, in terms of the moral of the story, so to speak, is that what we really want is that long-term memory where people are integrating new ideas with prior learning and then retrieving that for use. And that idea is, uh, the, the notion here is that uh, as people transform from one media to another, that process of integration and retrieval is strengthened. 
And so fundamentally, that's the learning theory that we're using as we think about these virtual contexts in a very quick version. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Hema, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, environmental exploration possibilities. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm actually going to very quickly share uh, how powerful environmental exploration are, especially to empower student voice. Uh, as you can see just from this picture, it is a multidisciplinary endeavor. And as a result of this, it provides students the opportunities to explore uh, different points of view, different issues in their environment, not just through one lens, but through multiple lenses. Uh, may I please have the next slide? And in addition to this, uh, environmental explorations actually enhance the practices across discipline. And this one slide, if you actually take about 15 seconds to look through, you'll see that environmental explorations can support practices across disciplines, starting from math to ELA to science and then also social studies. Now, uh, on the next slide, please. Uh, this is where I want to spend a little bit of time talking about specifically the MIWI connections and specifically about student co-creating these virtual contexts. So uh, early on in the presentation, you saw one of my students work. This was two days into the start of the school. We are virtual. I asked my students to actually pick a place, their favorite place. So that was their first task. And that was just a task so that the students can learn the tool, which is Google Tour Creator. So the next assignment is for my students to actually go to that same location, which is their favorite location. And I specifically asked them to pick sites that is accessible to them, uh, places that they can visit safely, and to actually start looking for issues in their favorite location. And the next step is to actually start looking at the investigation, like collecting data. What, uh, what about the issue? Uh, they need to investigate a little more. Uh, what sorts of data should they collect? And based on the data that they collect, they actually come to conclusions. And based on the conclusions, they have to come up with an action project. And my plan this year is to use these virtual contexts as a way for my students to experience their place in a meaningful way, and also to empower them to look at it from an issue perspective, from an investigative perspective, uh, drawing conclusions, explanations, and also doing something about it. Uh, so these virtual contexts, uh, someone described it this morning as, an, as a digital estuary, uh, a place where the power of storytelling comes together with the power of not only data, but also youth voice and youth action. Uh, so I want to take uh, just about a minute and think about where in your current situation, which MIWI element, the VCs that you create or that you would want your students to create would fit in. And if you could please share, share that in the Padlet. And Aida, could you please share a couple of them as they come in? Thank you. So I'm seeing a couple of them here saying that VCs can help students and others identify issues as um, they might also help to allow for the actual outdoor field experiences. Actually, now I'm seeing three people talking about outdoor field experiences. Excellent. Um, let's see yeah. if these are coming in. This is it. I'm just going to mention ahead. that um, as we you know, look at these ideas, you know, this idea of the connection between getting excited about being in a place and actually going there is really what we're looking for. So I'm glad to see that people are seeing the connection between the virtual context and the actual outdoor field experience, because that's something that's that we think is very um, much a connection that we can emphasize in the creation of the virtual contexts. Absolutely. And I'm seeing several of those comments now can help with documenting action projects before and after and helping to connect issues, looking for how smaller ecosystems are connected through those issues 
uh, and considering them in systems thinking before traveling out to the site. Exploring the place virtually for background information first. And somebody mentioned too that they could be used both before and after. And that's a really important point to make. Thanks for sharing that. That we think about them a lot as something because of the times we're in as can happening before the actual field trip. But we actually do see this as something that also when the students come back because they can collect assets, images and other information while they're at the site and then use it afterward. Yep. Thanks to Thank everybody you. for contributing there. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure to do was to provide you with some additional resources that we thought would be specifically and, and uh, very helpful for you if you wanted to go ahead and use Google Tour Creator uh, or Google Earth Projects or ESRI Story Maps to start working on a virtual context of your own. So this website, uh, the short link to it is bit.ly forward slash 360360VFT. will take you to the Earth Science All Around website and up at the top navigation bar, you can choose the tool that you would want. There are step-by-step -step guides there that will help you to create your virtual context as well as examples of them on each one of those pages. So I encourage you to take a look at that website as a resource, and we'll drop that link into the chat box for you. Ed. So we know we covered a fair amount of territory, uh, metaphorically speaking, and in terms of intellectual territory today, and we wanted to just summarize the, about what we've been talking about, um, the idea that we're really looking to enhance the environmental experiences and empower learners, uh, as they do, as we do that by letting them create the contexts, uh, encouraging multiple perspectives, as has been described, and really focusing on that framework provided by the place-based education through the development of the sense of place. So that that website that Aida just shared with you, the bit.ly.360 or slash 360 VFT, um, provides a lot of resources. If you want, if you get interested in this and want to expand. Um, Britt's going to now talk about some, some opportunities that are being worked on to organize additional long-term workshops. Britt? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Britt Slattery. I'm with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, we have been supporting and hope to continue supporting um, more of these workshops. So Ed and his team did um, sort of a pilot with with several teachers from Somerset County in Maryland this summer and the teachers responded really well to it. They We had great participation. Um, they really liked the workshop and through the workshop they were able to develop their own field experiences um, to share with their students and with the idea that they would use them with their students during the school year but also eventually um, engage the students in co-creating their own um, experiences to share with others. So um, this is really powerful learning. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think at least one of the examples that Ed showed you uh, of the tour came from one of the Somerset County teachers. Um, so there's another workshop that's starting uh, next week uh, for teachers on mostly on Maryland's Eastern Shore. And that one, it filled up really quickly. Um, and then we're hoping to set up another one that will be later this fall and or in the winter, and it would be a train the trainer format um, for environmental education providers and other educators who could help other people to develop their own um, virtual context or train them. Um, either those folks trained could develop them for teachers to use or train other people you know, to sort of keep this this rolling. Um, so Bart has put in the chat a, another Bitly, the um, VC Interest, which is a Google a Google form. Um, we would really love uh, your input into this because we're trying to figure out when is the best time to hold this this upcoming workshop. Um, so in it, it will ask you about preferences. Um, for the number of sessions and the, t the best time of the year to hold this. So we would really love for those of you who are interested in learning more to fill that out. And then also you'll, you'll get information about the workshop when it's available. Uh, so this is really great work and um, 
we're excited to see more of it happening. And so thank you to everyone on this team. Thanks so much, Brent. And I'll just mention very quickly, you can uh, take down my email address as we finish up here. We're right at the top of the hour. If you do have questions, feel free to email me. Thanks all. Yes, thanks again, um, Ed and everyone for presenting. Um, yeah, like Britt said, uh, the one that's hosted on the Eastern Shore filled up really fast. So we're hoping to fill up another workshop coming up. So please use that Google form um, to share your interest. Uh, we will be contacting everyone using the email they shared in the registration form. We'll make sure to share that Google form once again. A few of you asked about recordings. All of our webinars are recorded and it actually lives on the Chesapeake Bay Program's YouTube page. So we'll make sure to share that link as well. Um, and also, Ed and anyone else, I know a few people had trouble looking at the, um, the Google Tour live when you're navigating. So if you guys wouldn't mind sharing a few Google Tour examples, we can plug that into the email too so people can you know, explore a little on their own um, and get an idea what, you know, it could be useful for them. Absolutely. And I would just note that there are several of them on that website that we just dropped into the chat box, the bit.ly forward slash 360 VFT. So you can see several of the different tours, the VCs there. Good point. That's a really good location to find too. Thanks. So, um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and close this out. We want to thank you all again for joining us. Um, I think Ed and the team, if you have a couple of minutes, we'll hang on for some additional questions. And um, one just kind of as popped up, you know, sort of towards the end here from Meredith was uh, thinking about urban populations and the use of um, those, these VCs in that context, but also, you know, mostly thinking about like the safest place for them to be might not be outside in the neighborhood, right? And the access to green space is a challenge. So do you have any suggestions or thoughts about this kind of approach in a, you know, in a context where maybe, um, you know, you can't get to those green spaces to take the pictures necessarily. That's a really good uh, point, Bart. We have been focusing on environmental exploration, but a lot of young people, their environment is urban. Or, um, and I know that Hama's students, for example, um, she can probably speak to this better, have been choosing a wide range of sites that they, to, build their virtual context around. Hema, do you want to speak to that? Sure, absolutely. Um, out of 20 uh, virtual contexts that my student created, uh, about 16 of them were a local coffee shop, uh, a local eatery that the, that the students like to hang out. Uh, so they found places that really mattered to them. And it was just two students who picked a park or something that was green. Uh, so uh, even with those, the kids were able to make connections and I'm positive when they start looking for issues in their favorite locations, even in those urban environments, even in that coffee shop, they will be able to either find and solve some issues or if there are issues that they that were solved in an innovative way, maybe they'll be able to showcase it to the bigger community. So those are all potential options, yes. Thank you, Hema. Thank you, Ed. Um, and like I said, we can just hang out here for maybe a minute or two, see if people have other questions, but otherwise, thank you all very much. If you do have a question, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand if you wanted to verbalize it. We can unmute you, unmute you and kind of call you up, um, or you can put it into the, the question box. We can follow up there too. And uh, while we're waiting to see if any of those pop in, Ed, Mark, hey, Maida, and um, oh gosh. Sequoia is in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was looking for that name. Um, thank you all very much, you know, for um, for doing this, and uh, this will be an interesting workshop. And it was a great presentation. It's perfect. Thanks, thanks to all of you for the opportunity, and to all of the people who attended for the great work you're doing in the different areas where you're working with learners as well. Appreciate it. Um. Um, I, I do have a question here. Someone was saying that um, students came up with the idea of using GoPro cameras um, to record live stream field work from the field to their students. Is anyone doing this? Um, and can you connect me with someone who might help us get started? I don't know if anyone knows of people using GoPro cameras for field work. Not specifically GoPro. Um, 
I, I can ask around. I'm, I'm actually looking into something uh, called Gimbal, uh, where it's, it's almost like a handheld stand where you can hook up your cell phone and it trains, it, it follows you and it kind of uh, learns your movements. So I'm actually, and it's comparatively cheaper than Grow Pros from what I hear. So that's something that I'm looking into where students can check them out, just use their cell phones to make these. So that's something that I'm looking into right now. We have another question in the chat box. Um, looking for advice on how to set expectations while having students participate in VCs, especially if you're not confident that they'll be able to go on in-person field experiences in the spring. And that, that's a great question. And that's um, one of the, the questions and the topics that we cover in the longer workshop. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to everything in this workshop. So we did um, start out with Ed's little storyboarding, the handwritten version of it. And we have some more formalized versions of storyboarding and thinking about how you collect and organize the information that goes into a virtual context and then assessing them through a rubric driven assessment. So um, uh, Maura Duffy, thank you for submitting that question and, and we'd love to talk more about that. And if you can join one of our workshops, that would be great. Um, Suzanne Kirk also had a question just about um, sharing that storyboarding sheet that you use, if that's something we can put out there in the resources or not. Um, Aida, is that already on the, the Earth Science All Around? If it's not, it will be. We'll put it on there. Yeah, this particular slide deck has not made its way there yet, but it will be there by, I would say, the end of the day today. So check there under uh, creating a virtual context under that tab. Um, all right, so not, not, not seeing any new questions coming in. Plenty of thank yous and kudos, though. Um, uh, I think we're in a good place to uh, close things out um, for, for the afternoon. And, you know, I wish hope you all have a good rest of your afternoons and a, and a good weekend. And, um, talk to and or see you virtually later. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks invitation. Bye. Bye all. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for covering for me. Like uh, my phone was at Best Buy and my internet was glitchy. So truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really like a perfect storm, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nice work. Thank you. Cool. And um, Tristan, maybe we can just link over to the um, to the site that Aida was talking about um, to to get access to the slides or the PDF of the slides, maybe, and then the recorded version we'll put within the regular webinar um, home too. Do you mean the the Chesapeake Bay program page? Yeah, where where we've been putting yeah. the rest of them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you can put it both places. I think the slides though, that's yeah. fine. If they just yeah, I got the website, so um, maybe. Or I'll draft up like a response to the whole group. We can make sure we have all those links and stuff. Cool. All right. Awesome. <laughs> I'm really hanging out now though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye everyone. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye bye. bye. Unless there's other questions. Good. Yeah.